Um, since we've been talking about land reform, I actually want to go back and, and give you a little bit more detail on that. I think um, one thing that, you know, one of the questions uh, earlier pointed out was that we don't know as much about the North. And so um, I, I think it is useful, actually, to go back and to give a little more detail to what's happening in these societies. Um, soon enough, we'll get to the JFK and LBJ years, which are obviously critically important. But I think we'll be dealing with information in those periods that people are somewhat familiar with, whereas the more I, I study Vietnam and the more I teach it, the same earlier period becomes more interesting to me for that reason, because we know less about it, but it really is critical in shaping the nature of a struggle, which in the 1960s we're going to know a great deal about. So I want to go back, actually, and do a little bit more on this whole issue of land reform and the chaos it un unleashes, because I think that's important. Um, we know a great deal about the southern half of Vietnam, the ZM regime, the repression, the Can Lo Party, the personalist ideology, but what's happening in the north? Um, the north has many problems of its own. It goes through many crises, too, but I think they are of a different nature. Um, the first thing Ho Chi Minh has to deal with above the 17th parallel, of course, is reconstruction, rebuilding. As I said, the, uh, uh, most of the war against the French had taken place in Tonkin and places like Dien Bien Phu. So there's this really critical problem of reconstruction, wars, you know, damage, infrastructures and economies and whatnot. And so um, there is actually a bit of an economic revival after the war from like 55 to 57, but most of that is because of peasant initiative rather than because of any central government economic policy. And in large measure, this peasant initiative is a result of land reform. Ho Chi Minh, as he had done briefly in 1945-46, institutes a fairly significant policy of land reform in which uh, millions of hectares of land are going to be transferred to landless peasants. Uh, the real problem associated with this, of course, is going to be uh, not necessarily who gets it, but who gives it. And this is going to cause all kinds of political issues that you know, I, I alluded to earlier and I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Land reform actually begins um, as soon as uh, 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 Dien Bien Phu uh, falls. The, actual, uh, the first wave of land reform, it kind of occurs in various waves, uh, begins in May of 1954 and it lasts through the September of that year. And uh, associated with land reform are rent reduction campaigns as well. The first land reform program is fairly, fairly limited, about 50 villages. But then the second wave, you know, you know, it's not critically important that we know when each wave occurs or anything like that. But the second wave from late 54 into the early months of 55 uh, uh, liberates about 210 villages. Uh, I'm sorry, creates land reform in about 210 liberated villages. And there's more rent reduction at this point. Um, wave three of land reform is in February of June of uh, 55, and this is important because it moves up north into the Red River Delta. If we uh, go to the map here, I think you'll remember that the Red River Delta is up north here. It's the northernmost part that cuts through uh, the areas of real political significance like Hanoi. And so, uh, and these are real strongholds, of course, of the Viet Minh. Um, in addition to that, though, when land reform goes up north into the Red River area, um, many landlords and rich peasants <clears throat> who had remained loyal till the end toward the French begin to find their property threatened, and this is going to uh, lead to some issues there. Now, uh, as I said, um, once the war comes full swing, one of the many uh, uh, attacks against Ho Chi Minh and the communists will be that they slaughtered, you know, untold numbers of people. Nixon at one point claims a half a million. Um, which is a wildly inaccurate figure. There were clearly issues and there was repression and there were uh, peasants killed. Uh, but this really in, in many ways is the result of an internal struggle within the communist movement. And uh, uh, one thing this I think also points to is that this is not a rigid Stalinist party. That there really are divisions within the the uh, Vietnamese communist and Ho Chi Minh, although he is this incredibly prestigious national figure, cannot simply impose policy upon uh, his people the way, for example, Stalin could. So you do have variants of uh, something like the Red Guard, almost, although not nearly anywhere on that kind of level in Vietnam. You really do have these splits and divisions within the Vietnamese communist movement, which are going to cause problems. Uh, the two key people in this are going to be old friends, dear friends, Trong Chin and Ho Chi Minh. Uh, I've mentioned Trong Chin before, and he's a, a very important figure. Uh, Trong Chin is the head of the Land Reform Committee. Uh, there's another group called the National, Union, National United Front, 
And they're also going to uh, 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 be part of this. Now, Chong Chin and the Land Reform Committee believe that land reform is part of a class struggle and that land reform has to be used to uh, punish people who hold lots of land, land rich, especially landlords and so-called rich peasants, peasants who had uh, a significant amount of land. Okay. Uh, the National United Front, however, uh, it, by the term front imply, as the term front implies, uh, has a more expansive view of Vietnamese society, of northern Vietnamese society. And they want maximum political unity, and they do not want to aggravate or exacerbate class struggle. So then Trong Chin represents kind of the class struggle element. Let's, let's hit the, the landlords hard. The National United Front represents this kind of unity. Okay? And Ho essentially falls in with the front aspects of it. He essentially becomes a, an advocate of frontism, of, of uh, an umbrella or a coalition rather than, uh, you know, class resentment and class anger. So amid this, then, uh, the biggest waves of land reform occur in 1955 and 1956, where uh, many hundreds of villages, okay, and the goal ultimately of land reform, as everybody envisions it, is to put political and economic control into the hands of the so-called working peasants. These tend to be the middle and poor and landless peasants. This is the ultimate goal. They should be the vanguard of Vietnamese society. But that doesn't mean, as far as Ho is concerned, that others who have a little more land than that should be punished or should be left out, whereas Trong Chin and others believe that they should be. And this is really where the issue is going to going to move toward. Okay? So during that last big wave of land reform in 55 and 56, which covers over half of the villages, um, uh, uh, the committee that, that Trong Chin heads begins an attack on rich peasants and landlords. He accuses them of sabotage um, and basically says, watch out, they're not really loyal, patriotic Vietnamese. You can't really trust them. They have to be punished. They, we have to, to suppress them. However, Ho Chi Minh, in a speech to the same cadres, the same people who would be working to affect land reform that Chong Chin had talked to, uh, stressed the need to avoid physical abuse of those who were denounced and to correctly classify people, not to simply you know, kind of in, get engaged in this kind of McCarthyism where you just accuse somebody of being a landlord and attack him that way. So then um, uh, Ho Chi Minh and Trong Chin, again, you know, old allies, dear friends, are on opposite sides of this. Okay? Uh, Trong Chin, however, controls the cadres at the grassroots level, and they get out of control. So you begin to see attacks, often indiscriminate, against those who hold significant amounts of land, even though Ho Chi Minh has said, so long as they're loyal to us, so long as they're nationalistic, so long as they're patriotic, we are willing to work with them. They can be loyal members of this society and of this government. Right? And Ho Chi Minh, in fact, admits that there are errors, admits that there are problems in it. He gives a speech in, um, in uh, early 1956, and he says, land reform is a class struggle against feudalism, an earth-shaking, decisive, hard revolution. Still, because the opposing enemy has carried out insane sabotage, because some of our cadre do not yet firmly grasp the policies, do not yet correctly practice the mass line, because the leadership of the party central committee in government has had concrete deficiencies, he's talking about Trong Chin here, in urging inspection. This is why land reform has caused deficiencies and mistakes in the tasks of achieving rural unity, attacking the enemy, the question of reorganization, and agricultural tax policies, etc. It's an admission of error. Trong Chin's gone too far, although it's not, a, it's not an attack on him. If you read between the lines, it's a fairly strong statement. So, so Ho Chi Minh goes on. It is necessary to rectify weak, weak points. What are the weak points? Such as not relying completely on the poor and landless peasants, not uniting closely with the middle peasants, and not truly allying with the rich peasants. So the weak points are not uniting with the middle peasants and not allying with the rich peasants. So Ho sees those as weaknesses, as problems, that in fact that these people are left outside the party and need to be brought in. Ho's comrade Von Nguyen Jap echoes these ideas and accuses Trong Chin and others of leftism. I know this is starting to sound like this arcane Politburo debate, and, and in part it really is. But um, um, uh, Jop says that uh, Ho, uh, Trong Chin and his cadre have correctly relied on the poorest landless peasants to be the vanguard of Vietnamese society. Everybody agrees on that. 
Um, but even some of them have been attacked because of this overzealous attitude. Uh, Jap says that the policy of uniting with the middle peasants has been neglected by the Land Reform Committee under Chong Chin's leadership, uh, that an alliance with the rich peasants has not been attempted, and in fact too many landlords have been uh, uh, I'm sorry, too many rich peasants have been attacked and treated as if they were landlords. There are different levels. A landlord is somebody who actually has land and leases it out. A rich peasant is somebody who has his own land for subsistence. You have middle level peasantry and poor peasantry and those who are totally landless. So not all peasants are the same. There are different gradations there. And, and so Jap is saying that even rich, rich peasants are okay, we're willing to work with them and we're treating them as if they're landlords. And Jap even goes so far, as far to say that uh, you shouldn't indiscriminately attack landlords if they're pro-French, if they're you know, violating the will of the people, if they are you know, a hoe off and causing the local despots. Yeah, in that case you can, but some of these landlords may be potential allies and we can use them to, to build a new North Vietnamese society. Many have given meritorious service during the resistance. Many of them are anti-French, many of them are loyalists. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, you have to be nice to them. Don't, don't attack them indiscriminately. Uh, Jap then, um, in this major speech he gives, uh, admits that innocent people have been treated unjustly. And he says these actions led to widening, led to a widening of the scope of attack to attacking the enemy indiscriminately and to the widespread use of overly repressive measures. Can you imagine Joe Stalin admitting to using overly repressive measures? Even Mao, who really lost control of the Cultural Revolution, I mean, in many ways, it wasn't his, the way it turned out wasn't his doing, never admitted that he used overly repressive measures. The Red Guard, you know, he lost control of him. He would never think of that. Yet, Ho and Von Nguyen Jap do that. So from these comments, you can see that, that there are a couple things, you know, some things have gone seriously wrong with the land reform program. And Ho Chi Minh and the Central Committee and Von Nguyen Jap recognize that, and, and they're taking uh, uh, steps to rectify it. Um, land reform, this class struggle has gone out of control. And the party has been seriously damaged. North Vietnamese has been North Vietnam has been seriously damaged okay? um, uh, by attacking those peasants who may hold more land than others. Trong Chin and the and the Land Reform Committee has really uh, angered uh, a potentially significant group of supporters. Okay? So Ho Chi Minh says that. Uh, uh, the cadre have pushed this concept of landlord beyond its boundaries, and it's incorporating too many peasants who are being attacked indiscriminately. Um, in fact, land reform activists, Ho, Ho very angrily says, have introduced a, no, a new category of pe people who are suspected, those, quote, connected with landlords. So if you are connected with landlords, then you too come under attack. It's like talking to a communist uh, in, in the McCarthy period, right? It's truly guilt by association. And um, Ho gets people who write for the, the, the official party newspaper in the North to attack Trong Chen in this overzealous application of, of land reform. Now, this too does lead, in fact, to uh, uh, real problems, in fact, repression and bloodshed, especially, ironically, in Ho's home province of Nyan, which is in the, the Anam region. Uh, Nia An was one of the real hotbeds of revolt against the French and remained so uh, uh, into the 1950s. And it had had a strong Communist Party and mass organization since 1930. In Nia An, though, Trong Chin's Land Reform Committee had, had committed a lot, of, a lot of bad mistakes. It had attacked many uh, ardent communists, in fact. It had gone after people who were very loyal communists but who held land, and it had punished uh, uh, land reform activists and party members. So Trong Chin essentially goes after Ho's, Ho's people, you know, which is uh, a, a really a mistake. Um, Ho Chi Minh reacts forcefully and strips Trong Chin of his uh, uh, designation as the party general secretary. I mean, this would be like, you know, uh, deposing a prime minister or firing your vice president, you know, if Clinton fired Gore or something like that. So this is fairly serious. Uh, Ho Chi Minh takes this very serious. Um, and in fact, he does this prior to a major uprising in Yan, despite Ho taking steps and apologizing. Peasants in Yan have a, a spontaneous revolt in November of uh, 1956. Um, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, Trong Chin calls out the army and it, it turns quite un uh, ugly. And in fact, several hundred peasants were probably uh, killed uh, during that uprising. Okay? Overall, uh, there was a repression as a result of land reform. Perhaps 
12,000 Vietnamese were jailed at one time or another during the land reform campaigns of 55 through around 57 or 58. Um, many were killed uh, at Nyan, probably several hundred. Overall, it's totally, it's impossible to get a real accurate number. I mean, Nixon's claim of 500,000 is, is ludicrous. It's just demographically not possible that it could be that many. Many opponents of the regime later would say about 25,000. That's probably high. That's probably pretty high, too. It could be in the three to 5,000 range. Some people go as low as eight, eight or 900. I suspect it's probably in the three to 5,000 range. Uh, and again, you know, you get bogged up in the numbers and it becomes sort of inhuman. You know, if it's, is it, it's okay if it's 500, but not if it's 800. I mean, that's, that's silly. The point is a, a fair number were, were killed and, and a larger number were imprisoned as a result of that. What I find really, really striking, though, is that afterward, right, Trong Chin loses his office and Ho Chi Minh takes steps to correct the land reform committee's actions. What's he do? He actually returns property. So um, among those who Ho believed had had their property wrongfully taken, he returns 64% of their houses, 40% of their animals, and compensates 20% of them. That's not everyone. It's not enough. But the fact of the matter is he admitted a mistake, sacked Trong Chin, basically gutted the Land Reform Committee, and began to make restitution. Okay? Uh, you don't have to like Ho Chi Minh to recognize that as being fairly unusual behavior. I mean, it's not Stalinist. It's not Mao. It ain't the United States after the Civil War, and it surely is not what Neo Dinh Diem is doing below the 17th parallel. One doesn't have to see Mao. Mao uh, Ho Chi Minh is not an angel. He's not a saint. But neither is he the Neo family. Neither does he have the same type of cult of personality and repressive policies that Diem has in the South. Uh, uh, North Vietnam can be a very difficult society, and the regime is undergoing almost constant crisis after the, the, the Dien Bien Phu ends and after the, the war ends, after the First Indochina War ends. But Ho takes steps that, that they would never have thought of taking in the South. He admits errors publicly. He and Von Nguyen Jap, they get rid of their buddy. They cover, you know, they, they essentially choose to go with the peasantry. Is this good cop, back up? I don't think so. I mean, it seems sincere. The party was fully behind Ho. He used the party organ. I mean, he and Trong Chen, there's no evidence that Trong Chen was trying to pull a power play and Ho had to put him in his place. This really was a, 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 uh, a disagreement above all on how to go through land reform and what class struggle meant. Trong Chen was always far more doctrinaire than Ho was. Ho has a unique vision among communists of this kind of peasant nationalist communism. And he believes that land reform is crucial to that. And you really have to follow through. You can't just talk the talk. You've got to walk it. And so he takes measures toward that end. And so um, even though, you know, it really is, this is a dark period in North Vietnam from 55 to 58, it essentially, you know, the party survives in large measure because of Ho Chi Minh, Ho Chi Minh's leadership at the time. He again assumed the mantle of Uncle Ho, siding with the people against the bureaucrats, basically. Um, there are other problems that the North has to face. Land reform is clearly the biggest, but there are also a lot of economic problems which are going to be inevitable when you have a country which was essentially a, a dependent colony and then fights this major war against France and then boom all of a sudden the war's over and they're on their own. So you have major problems in terms of uh, uh, inflation and, and underproduction. Um, floods and drought, I mean as if things aren't bad enough, flood and drought are common from 55 through 57. Um, there are um, in the planting seasons uh, between 150 and 250,000 hectares of land affected by drought or by flood, sometimes both. So uh, these are serious problems. As a result of that, the price of consumer goods goes up. Raw sugar, pork, things like that, the prices are going up substantially uh, uh, because of um, uh, the problems associated with reconstruction and with uh, bad weather. Okay? In addition to that, there are political critics of the regime. Uh, the National Lawyers Committee stages public protests uh, against the judicial system. They said they want to institute a system where you know, you're, you're assumed innocent until guilty, that judges should be independent of other politicians, uh, and so forth. Um, and again, uh, there is some judicial reform. It's not a, a Western-style judiciary, but there is some judicial reform. Um, some members of the party actually sign a petition attacking the police 
for engaging in uh, anti-democratic activities. They believe the police are part of this land reform repression and they attack them. Um, Jap himself, in fact, uh, gives a spirited defense of democracy and popular power in this period. Uh, Von Nguyen Jap says, uh, in past years, in the face of the difficult and complex situations of the resistance, and in the period which immediately followed the restoration of peace, a limitation of democracy to a certain extent was correct and necessary in accordance with the needs of the patriotic war and the maintenance of order and security. However, in the recent period, there have been numerous failings in the building of our popular democratic power. The democratic rights of the people were not fully realized. We did not pay attention to the guarantees of the system of democratic legality, particularly in land reform, and putting organizations into good order and controlling households, etc. This is a, a private statement at a party plenum. He doesn't have to fake it for the press. This was not an interview with a Western journalist. All right, so Von Nguyen Jap internally is saying, we have been anti-democratic and we have to correct this. And that's the striking thing. I mean, people say, oh, this was just, ho, oh, you know, exploiting the Western media, twisting them and using them. But in fact, these, uh, many of these statements and these sentiments are often expressed internally in party newspapers, in party documents, and at party uh, uh, congresses and party plenum. So it's, I mean, you know, uh, I would have to, you know, maybe I'm a dupe, but I, I assume there is some level of sincerity here that this is actually... Uh, part of a, a legitimate political program. Okay? Um, so actually they do institute some reforms, uh, some legal reforms, some judicial reforms. Uh, they institute some uh, democratic reforms within the party voting and things like that. Um, and again, I mean, this is not a Western style democracy, but neither is it by any means uh, uh, Moscow and it's certainly not Saigon either. Okay? So um, Ho Chi Minh basically has quite a dilemma that he, he carefully navigates in the late 50s. He wants to get the support of as many people as he can, including wealthy uh, uh, landlords if they are patriotic landlords, including national capitalists. If you're a capitalist, that's okay. If you're a national capitalist, if you believe in putting uh, the needs of North Vietnam ahead of your own needs or the, or the needs of your global industries or whatever, um, so he is willing then to accept landlords, to accept rich peasants, and many people uh, uh, who are in the party with him, like Trong Chin, resent that and they're deeply suspicious of this influence of the landlords, many of whom are, are Catholic, by the way. And so uh, Ho, Ho Chi Minh has to kind of deal with that. Now, Ho, at the time, um, basically has to deal with something that would later become uh, an issue in the Soviet Union in the 1980s and 1990s. What level of political opening do you give people before it becomes too great a risk? You remember Gorbachev tries to institute both economic restructuring and political opening at the same time, and it eventually eats him. He can't do it. Because when you try to restructure the economy, it's going to unleash a lot of economic problems on people. And by opening the political system at the same time, people could vent these frustrations and create alliances with others. And in the end, Gorbachev couldn't control it. He couldn't ride it, and he was booted, and he's still terribly unpopular. Ho Chi Minh essentially realizes you can't do both at the same time, 30 years before Gorbachev attempted to do it. He tries to do this economic restructuring, land reform, and so forth, but understands that you can only, you know, as far as he sees it, you give people some openings, and he does believe in this kind of democratic uh, socialism. But at the same time, you can't let them go so far that they will upend the system and become your enemy. So you have to remain in control of what you unleash. You can't let it just simply boil over. This is kind of his way of, of seeing things. So he understands the risks, as he sees it, of too much political opening too soon at the same time that you're doing this economic restructuring, and he won't let it happen. So he will criticize Trong Chen and others, but at the same time, we'll try to keep the lid on it. So the travails of land reform and economic uh, crises then become um, manageable. The party has been given a stern warning from below. And something else that, as we'll see in a minute, with regard to the so southern insurgency, Ho often has to respond to pressure from below in ways, for example, that, you know, it, it's unlikely Stalin or Mao Zedong or, or uh, Franklin Roosevelt or Winston Churchill ever had to, you know, to be, to be quite clear on that. So Ho and the others understand that there is a long, difficult road ahead, and they're going to have to listen to uh, uh, the people. They can't simply take action unilaterally, as Trong Chin might have wanted to do. So 
um, despite some efforts at nationalization and some difficulties with, clear difficulties in repression with, with land reform, Ho survives it. And by 58, 59, South, North Vietnam seems somewhat stable. Okay. Any, any questions on that stuff? Yeah. I'm, push that. I'm interested in the point that was made in one of the readings, precisely talk, dealing with what you're talking about, that General Westmoreland had, am I getting his name right? Yeah. Westmoreland had uh, been a reader of Jap for 30 years. How can he have known so much and acted as if he knew so little about this striking anomaly yeah. in the whole communist world? You can't, I mean, I can't answer that terribly easily or quickly. Um, at some level, and, and we're going to spend a lot of time actually addressing questions like that. I mean, at some level, it's a real arrogance or hubris. Yeah, we know that, and, uh, but, you know, we're Americans, and we're incredibly powerful, and we won World War II, and we have all these weapons and technology and strength and intelligence and good soldiers and everything else, so um, we can overcome that. And besides, you know, that's, that's, that's my orders. That's what they told me to do. Yeah. Uh, during this period from, uh, <clears throat> say, 54 after Dien Bien Phu, uh, what would have been the relative, uh, not in actual numbers, but just comparison, per capita income differences between, say, the North and the South? Are we talking about, is it about the same? Um, southern, well, most, most Vietnamese are still farmers. They're in agriculture. Uh, the South is probably better off for a couple reasons. One, um, most of the war occurred in the North. The, the 46 to 54 war against France. So the South doesn't have the same problems with Reconstruction. And in addition to that, the Mekong is the rice belt of Vietnam. So rice production in the South is going to be better. And what's the biggest reason the South is going to be better off than the North from 55 on? Who's, who's paying the bills? The United States. I mean, they're getting vast sums of U.S. money in. So many people in the South are actually doing pretty well. Yeah. But, but say a, a peasant in the South, uh, the middle level yeah. peasant, would, would be better off than a middle level peasant in the North well, it doing the same thing, let's say? It depends because after land reform, a middle peasant in the North may be doing all right. I mean, conceivably, I mean, in terms of land, northern peasants are, are better off than southern peasants because remember, ZM essentially reverses the land redistribution that Ho had attempted, the VMN had attempted. So it can be, I mean, it depends. Uh, I think in the South, the, the real uh, question is going to be what your relationship to the regime and to the Americans is. If you have friends in the government, in the ZM, in, with the Neo family, or with the Americans, you're going to be doing fine. I mean, I would think the overall economic statistics in the South are much better than they are in the North. But if you're a landholder in the North who can take advantage of the land reform program, then you'll be doing okay. But, you know, there's always another kicker. I mean, the North has problems with rice production and with agriculture production, and the South is probably doing better that way because it didn't have to deal with the ravages of the war the way the North does. So there's not an easy answer to it, but um, it would depend in large measure. But overall, I would say the numbers certainly would favor the South. Okay? And um, especially, and I think the, the biggest thing there would just be American aid flows in such huge amounts that it can't help but you know, filter down to some elements of society, but by no means all. It's kind of like the trickle-down theory, you know, pouring syrup on a pancake. Which, which pancake gets all the syrup? It's the, the top one. So um, a, a, a taxi driver once explained uh, Reagan's economic policy to me in that way. Uh, made more sense than anything I'd ever heard on McNeil Lair or, or any of those things. Okay. So um, Ho Chi Minh has to deal with these problems. And, you know, if you compare this to something, let's say, for the, like the Cultural Revolution, I mean, in some ways, Trong Chin's cadre were very zealous, like the Red Guard, but it never came anywhere near getting out of control. I mean, Ho admits his errors, and, you know, several thousand, maybe 5,000 die, but that ain't millions, all right? So it really, I think, is a different system. But Ho has another situation to deal with, and that's the Southern insurgency, all right? And uh, actually, let me go uh, back to the map here. Um, the 17th parallels isn't, isn't demarcated here, but it's right around here, all right? Now, remember, in 1954, Vietnam's cut in half, and Ho Chi Minh is in charge of the north, which is the DRVN. Um, and in the south, you have the RVN, which is uh, uh, the uh, ZM regime, okay? And this is cut at the 17th parallel. Um, Geneva also allows for a relocation. So many, many, probably you know, anywhere from half a million to a million northerners, especially Catholics, moved to the south. 
many Southerners who were Viet Minh moved to the North. Many people who were native to the South or to the North might move back to their home province. In addition to that, though, there are still huge numbers of Southerners, uh, 150 to 300,000, depending on whose estimates. The U.S. Army estimates, I think, in the 250 to 300,000 range. There are still huge numbers of Southerners, native Southerners, who were Viet Minh who are opposed to the ZM regime. And this is who ZM goes after in things like Law 10 slash 59. And they're really getting gutted by the late 50s. A lot of these Southerners, these are not people that Ho Chi Minh trained in the North and sent to the South to cause ZM problems. These are people who were born and raised in the South, fought with the Viet Minh in the South, and stayed there after 1954, remained opposed to the ZM regime. And they are clamoring for action from the North and for help. Okay? They are getting buried. They are getting pretty much wiped out by the, the neo regime, by Law 1059, by the police, uh, by the army. Okay? So by 1958 59, this southern insurgency is really getting wiped out. Right? So ZM, in a sense, is a great success. And the most important aspect of the war, according to the Americans, ZM is a great success, and America becomes trapped by that success, because below the 17th parallel, he has really put a huge, huge hit on the opposition. He's really done a number on them, okay? So these Southerners then begin to uh, uh, really put pressure from below upon Hanoi, the northern capital, for assistance. In fact, uh, uh, communist leaders, Ho Chi Minh from Ho Chi Minh on down, had to admit that ZM had stabilized his regime in the South and had badly undermined Viet Minh morale. So there are a lot of ex-Viet Minh who, uh, a lot of, first of all, a lot of ex-Viet Minh who after 54 had essentially retired and gone into farming or whatnot, re-enter the struggle because they can't stand what, what's happening in the South. Some form secret cells, some establish bases and whatnot, but all of them essentially begin putting pressure on the North for help. Their basic line is, you want to reunify the country, help us now. We have to do it because we're getting wiped out. We're getting killed down here in the South. And so there's a real problem then in the relationship of the Northern Communist Party with the Southern insurgency, with the Southern militants. The United States will always claim throughout the 60s that North Vietnam invaded South Vietnam, that the North sent soldiers across the 17th parallel from the North into the South and they waged a war. They would see this uh, basically not even as a civil war but actually as an intervention by one country against another. Country A invades country B. Right? This is the way the U.S. always justified the war, and therefore the U.S. was coming to the aid of Country B, which had been attacked and invaded by Country A. Right? Well, the North Vietnamese, of course, would reject the assumption altogether. They would not see this as two different countries. They would say, look, this has traditionally, historically been one country, and, you know, in Geneva we were promised reunification anyway, so, you know, don't give me this stuff anyway. But, in fact, even more than that, the level of Northern support was minimal. The vast majority of people, almost totally, almost the total composition of the Southern opposition was native born to the South. In fact, from time to time, American intelligence would detect movements from the North to the South. When that happened, generally it was Southerners who were going to the North for training and returning. So it wasn't Northerners being sent to the South to fight. It was Southern. There were people who were called regroupees who were sent to the North, trained, and then returned to the South. So any movement you have in the late 50s and early 60s, almost 100% almost of that's going to be regroupees anyway. They're not going to be northern soldiers who come down. That's actually not going to occur well, till well into the war. The north is not going to start sending substantial numbers in until the war is f in, in progress. And by and large, many of them are going to be Pavan soldiers, northern regulars, rather than, than Viet Cong. The north won't uh, substantially fill the VC ranks actually until around Tat. Okay? Before that, it's still a southern group through recruiting and whatnot, but I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Um, anyway, the southern insurgents begin to put pressure on the north for assistance, and, and the man in the north in, the, in, in Hanoi, in the Politburo, who's in charge of the south, is Le Juan, L-E-D-U-A-N. My handwriting gets, gets worse all the time. So the nuns would always crack me on the hand with a, a ruler. 
Um, Le Duan uh, is in charge of the insurgency in the South. He's the liaison uh, to the insurgency in the South. And in fact, in 1958, he visits South Vietnam. And Ho and Le Duan want the South to very slowly go about things. They want them to rebuild the party, to engage only in political action, to mobilize the peasants to oppose the ZM regime, to create political movements but do not engage in military activity. They want to agitate in favor of the elections that Geneva provided. They want to create an international pressure on ZM to have elections. But this is Hanoi's advice to the South. Go slow, do political activities, do not involve yourselves in military activities yet. Uh, back off from any attacks on ZM because he'll crush you. He'll put you in jail, he'll kill you, all right? So, um, uh, Le Duan says that the party needs to, quote, combat the idea of violent, reckless, and dangerous armed struggle. This is what Ho and Le Duan are saying to the South. It is violent, reckless, and dangerous to get involved in armed struggle. You can't win. Now is not the time. So the North is suppressing the Southern movement, right? And in fact, there's a document on that, uh, which is, is, is hooked, linked up here. If you get a chance, you ought to take a look at it. There's some interesting stuff on there. Obviously, it, uh, on the screen, you're not going to be able to read it. But there's some interesting stuff there. Um, uh, in it, uh, and in fact, this is written by Le Duan, and it's called The Path of Revolution in the South. It's written probably around 56 or 57. Uh, and it says, the present situation is created solely by the USZM regime, so the problem is how to smash them, okay? There is no other path for the people of the South but the path to revolution. This is the conclusion. They actually have to do it. But uh, Le Duan is telling them to take their time, to go slowly. In the past years, the political struggle, political struggle, again, they're talking about, not armed struggle, uh, has shown that the masses have much capacity for political struggle with the USZM. In those struggles, if we grasp more firmly the struggle line and method, the movement can develop further to the advantage of the revolution politically. The cruel policy of USZM cannot break the movement or the people's will to struggle. There are those who think that the USZMs, they link them together as one, as, as a noun. The USZM's use of violence is now fundamentally at killing the leaders of the movement to destroy the party. And that if the Communist Party is worn away to the point that it doesn't have the capacity to lead the revolution, the political struggle cannot develop. That judgment is incorrect. Okay, why? Because the party doesn't run the struggle in the South. Those who lead the revolutionary movement are determined to mingle with the masses, to protect and serve the interests of the masses, and to pursue correctly the mass line. Between the masses and the communists, there is no distinction anymore. We have the same goals. We don't have to run them. We are not separate entities. So how can the USZM destroy the leaders of the revolutionary movement since they can't destroy the masses? Therefore, they cannot annihilate the cadre leading the mass movement. Okay. A lot of, you know, kind of jargon in that, but the point of the matter is uh, they're calling for political agitation, and they believe that time, and this is part of the, their, their theory, the communist national theory, protracted war, time is on our side. The people are with us, right? So it doesn't matter any longer if you're a communist or if you're a nationalist. We're all in this together because we all have the same ultimate goal, which is to, to eliminate the, the ZM regime. The problem is, is that the South doesn't really buy that. The South wants something to happen soon. They demand armed resistance because ZM is wiping them out. This is the darkest hour of the revolution. Okay, so Southern insurgents, some of whom are communist, many, I would argue most of whom are not, are putting heavy pressure then on Hanoi to help them out. Right? So, Ho continues, Le Duan continues to assert that only through protracted political struggle can the revolution succeed. Okay? In the process, this is a party uh, document, in the process of this difficult and complicated struggle, political struggle will be the main form, but because the enemy is determined to drown the revolution in blood, and because of the revolutionary mood in the South, it will be necessary, to a certain extent, to adopt methods of self-defense and armed propaganda, but to assist in the political struggle. But in the process of using self-defense and armed propaganda units, it is necessary to grasp thoroughly the principle, principle of emphasize, emphasizing political strength. 
I mean, at five different points in that little statement, they emphasize and stress the priority of political struggle, not armed struggle. Right? And again, the Southern insurgents say, that ain't enough. You're going too slow. So in the South, a lot of these uh, um, regroupees and a lot of old Viet Minh begin essentially creating armed conflict on their own. Now, beginning in 59, you start to see supplies moving from the north into the south. These are not insignificant amounts. And again, compared to the level of aid that the U.S. gives to South Vietnam, this is in insignificant. It's, it's a speck. I mean, and that's something, you know, I, I think it's such critical to keep in mind throughout this whole process, throughout this whole war. You know, if, if the north does not legitimately have the right to assist the southern insurgents, then why does the U.S. have the right to assist the RVN? I mean, I think that's a legitimate question that you have to keep in your mind throughout this whole process. So the northerners do begin sending some supplies, equipment, and regroupees, people from the south who were trained in the north and come back, into uh, the south beginning in 59. And uh, they bring supplies in uh, by bicycle, by backpack. They travel along something that the world will come to be known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Right? Um, and at this time, it, it really is not much more than a trail. I mean, the Ho Chi Minh Trail eventually will become, David Shoup, uh, General David Shoup called it the Ho Chi Minh Autobahn. It eventually becomes this incredibly intricate series of highways and paved and everything else. But in 1959, it's literally a trail through the jungles where people ride bicycles and get off and carry supplies and whatnot. And, uh, and most of it's foot traffic later, and I can handle armor and trucks and all kinds of stuff, but certainly not in 1959. The vast majority of these people coming to the south are regroupees, southerners who've been sent to the north and are coming back. Right. Uh, one regroupee uh, commented, this was a very interesting time for us in the northern part of Vietnam. We had always been strong fighters for the Viet Minh, and we had always admired Ho Chi Minh and the other Viet Minh leaders. The trip to North Vietnam was very difficult and very long, but we did not ever complain because we knew the difficulties were for the revolution. Our training in North Vietnam was also difficult. Sometimes the food was not very good. Sometimes we were very lonely and wanted to go home and see our family and friends. But we learned after a while not to be lonely, and we learned to find strength in our revolutionary struggle. We learned not to think much about our families anymore. We learned not to miss our families anymore, like Ho Chi Minh. So again, this is the story of a regroupee, somebody from the North going into the South. Right? So the North then is starting to slowly support the insurgents in the South, but not to the degree that the Southerners wanted. So the Southern activists begin to rebel. They begin to take up arms on their own uh, in uh, 1954, I'm sorry, 1958, 1959, and so forth. And uh, they are essentially leading the revolution in the South, and they're forcing the... Um, the northerners then to follow that lead. And so finally, the north gives in. In late 1960, the north acquiesces. Uh, in some measure, it's an acquiescence. In some measure, it's far more active than that. I don't want to make it seem like the north doesn't have any agency in here. They clearly do. But um, the northerners um, in 1960, in December, um, agree to the establishment of the NLF, the National Liberation Front. Technically, it's the National Liberation Front for South Vietnam, NLF, SVN. It is a front, an organization comprised of many different political groups which are committed to eliminating the ZM regime. Basically, that's what you need to get a card. That's what you need to, for admission. You have to want to get rid of ZM. Right? The front certainly includes communists, and many of the leaders of the front, most of the leaders of the front will be communists. Uh, Buddhists are in the front, landlords are in the front, intellectuals are clearly in the front. Uh, intellectuals despise the ZM regime, many do. Uh, Buddhist leaders, religious leaders, sect leaders are in the front. The National Liberation Front is, is truly a front in 1960 when it's created. It is an organization of various, a very fairly wide cross-section of South Vietnamese society opposed to ZM. Okay. And they issue this declaration, this is the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam. And of course it has all this wonderful revolutionary rhetoric, over, overthrow the camouflage colonial regime of the American imperialists and the dictatorial power of Ngo Dinh Diem, servant of the Americans, and institute a government of National Democratic Union and so forth. Okay. Uh, colonial regime dominated by the Yankees. But it's interesting because if you look down at the goals, 
institute a largely liberal and democratic regime, implement essential democratic liberties, freedom of opinion, press, movement, trade unions, religion, and so forth. Again, is this simply uh, uh, you know, a, a diversion for the Western press? Maybe so. This clearly was released. But it's not inconsistent, is it, with what Jap and Ho were saying during the land reform crisis of the 50s, which wasn't public, which was internal, all right? They want a, a general amnesty for prisoners and so forth. Uh, punish all the ZM bullies who have not repented and who have committed crimes against the people. Suppress, you know, uh, whatever, privatize, uh, revitalize, our, I'm sorry, agriculture, modernize production and so on. Uh, you know, taxation, labor codes, working conditions, reduce rents, institute land reform, and so on and so forth. Education, I mean, it's really a, a a f it's, it's a Western liberal document, right? Whether it was legit, whether it was sincere, uh, uh, you know, who knows? I mean, they never had a chance to try it out. But the fact of the matter is the NLF initially is clearly an attempt to get a popular movement against ZM going. So the front is established in 1960, so with the clear support of the North, laid to on and so forth. I would argue that the front remains indigenous for the most part, remains independent of northern control control, not influence, for the most part, for a long time. Really, I, again, I would argue until Tet, when, after Tet, actually, Tet itself doesn't really hurt the front and the VC that much. The, the period after Tet really does a number on them. But until that time, I would argue the South remains somewhat independent, a, a fair amount, actually, fairly independent from the North. Now, by 1975, when the war ends, it's a different story altogether, which we'll get to later. But, but in the earliest days of the front, and for a long time, until the losses became so great, uh, the front is is an independent entity in the South, so this is important as we talk about the war. There really are you know several different conflicts going on, and so you know what you'll have in this exact facsimile of Vietnam is uh, I mean clearly you're going to have northern pressure against the South through support and and personnel and things like that, and eventually you'll have PAV and forces. That's the the North Vietnamese Army, the People's Army of Vietnam. But, you know, I think the key to the war is going to be this internal struggle, you know, call it South versus South, NLF, later the VC would be a term given to fighters, Viet Cong, NLF VC against ZM and, and his successors. And this is, this is indigenous to the South. And so, and this is something when we, especially when we read my book, we're going to talk about at great length, you know, where do we fight this war? I mean, a lot of people in the Army, in the Marines, will say this, this war in the North is pointless. It does not, the, the war in the North is irrelevant. The, the real war is in the South. So we can bomb the North back to the Stone Age, but, but there are still going to be hundreds of thousands of Southerners who we haven't gotten rid of yet, and they're the real problem. This is the real crux of it. So the establishment of the NLF and the, this war internally in the South below the 17th parallel I think really is crucial to a, boy, that looks even worse on the screen than it does as I look down on it. <laughs> uh, so I would argue that this war in the South really is crucial, and this is what the Vietnam War is about. Who is the government in the South? Who runs Southern Vietnam below the 17th parallel? All right? Now, I kind of got ahead of things a bit when I said establishing the NLF. The NLF is, is the, is the uh, result of two things, pressure from below, which I just discussed, and another series of spontaneous uprisings. As I said before, throughout the um, uh, uh, late, well, throughout Vietnamese history, but throughout the late 50s, there are another outbreak of spontaneous uprisings where basically without any, certainly without any communist direction, without any really even local direction, peasants on their own would revolt against the village chief who was associated with the ZM regime or the local tax collector or whatever. And you start to see these uprisings occur with some frequency in 1959 and 1960. They're generally crushed and people in them are jailed or killed. But pretty soon, I mean, uh, the other southerners are saying, look, you know, again, we're getting killed out here. We need some help. And this is what finally compels the North to support the war in the South. I would argue that this is far from, you know, Northern aggression against South Vietnam. In fact, it's a very belated response to this urgent plea from the South to save them before ZM kills them all, right? So again, I would, I, you know, I would reject the idea that this is an invasion from the North against the South. This is not two independent countries fighting it out. This is a war for national liberation, 
a revolution. I wouldn't even call it a civil war. I mean, it's a civil war in the sense that the, you know, I guess in the sense that South Vietnam would be like the Confederacy in many ways. It was a, kind of a, a, a recent creation that the other side would not claim had legitimacy, would not claim that had international legitimacy, okay? So that's Vietnam. We spent a lot of time on it up to 1960, but I think it's worthwhile, okay? Now we'll get to the fun stuff. That's what everybody wants to talk about. JFK, any, anything on this other stuff on Vietnam? All right. Yeah? Could you say something about the uh, ongoing, apparently I'm, I'm seeing in the readings that the NLF uh, and the North Vietnamese government, but specifically the NLF, was able to carry on a parallel system of taxation mm -hmm. and land reform within their own mm -hmm. while DM was yeah. doing his reform. Yeah, that's, it's actually quite more remarkable, uh, again, in an exact map. And it looks just like the previous one, right? Um, in the South, there are hundreds and hundreds of, of villages, and there are provinces and districts and so forth. It's, you know, like any other country, it's going to have different uh, political organizations, right? Different administrative and civil, civil uh, institutions. The Viet Cong, the, the, let me, the National, I will often just call it the National Liberation Front. Uh, ZM uh, develops, invents a very derisive, insulting term to the Viet Cong. It's called, he calls them the Viet Cong. Viet Minh become Viet Cong. Viet Cong means Vietnamese communists. And they don't want to be called that because they consider themselves part of a front. Basically, the press picks it up, everybody picks it up, they start using it themselves. But initially, it is a, it's an insulting term. So if I say NLF VC, I'm using it interchangeably. Technically, the NLF is the political wing and the VC is the military wing of the same movement. It would be like the relationship between uh, uh, the IRA and Sinn Féin in Ireland or something like that. All right. So the NLF uh, is trying to wage the war at the village level, political warfare, right? So many villages, and I will use red for a specific reason here, are very strongly attached to the front. And these areas, which are NLF strongholds, and in fact, by 1960, there are estimates uh, all over the place, again, that the NLF has influence in a third to half of, of southern villages, especially down here in the Mekong. The Mekong is heavily red. It's, it's heavily uh, front-controlled. Uh, um, in these areas, uh, the government's tax collectors basically don't show up. They know better. They are targets. They are the local despots there. So um, the VC established, basically, you're right, an alternative society. Um, land, uh, uh, tax rates uh, uh, instituted by ZM were quite high. Uh, the VC would, would um, uh, institute lower taxes. Uh, they would, um, uh, often the government would come in and take rice production as taxes, things like that. The VC wouldn't do that. Um, if somebody got at hand, I mean, they, they wouldn't hesitate to execute them. I mean, if a teacher was, you know, giving the, the uh, pro-government what they perceived as a program, they, they'd off them. I mean, there's no question there. Um, these guys aren't angels. I'm not trying to give you that impression. They would use violence and coercion. But for the most part, they prefer to use politics because in the end, you kill a bunch of people, you're going to make enemies that way. So I think that, you know, uh, politically they understand that this is a better way to do it if you can get people on your side. And it's not a real tough sell to make. I mean, it's not real hard to convince people that ZM is not good for them. You know, especially, you know, and they, they'll, in, in some cases, they'll use a religious argument, you know, to the Buddhists. You know, look at what he's doing to, to the Buddhists, as we'll see, it gets worse later. Or to a sect, you know, ZM and his cronies are, you know, ripping you off. Or to, you know, basically land, you know, hey, you had land reform, and look, they took your land away. So, I mean, for the most part, they do try to make a political, but, but they will use force if they have to. They'll blow up a school, they'll kill a school teacher or a minister or whatever, if they have to. Uh, these, they're, they're, they're playing hardball, I'm not trying to give you the impression that they're pitiless victims or anything like that. That's not the case at all. But in those areas where they have control, yes, they will institute a different system. I mean, it, this is taken from you know, uh, Mao Zedong in the earliest days of the Chinese Revolution during the Long March. I mean, Mao actually had his people keep records of peasants who provided them with rice during the Long March and later made attempts to, in some cases, to, to actually repay these people. Of course, Mao goes way off the deep end later. But in fact, this is part of the, uh, this is people's war. I mean, if you're going to fight people's war, then you're going to have to make attempts to do this. Even if it's window dressing, you have to make attempts to do this. So that's, I think, generally when they instituted, uh, when they had control in the, 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 the South, they tried to show that there was this alternative model, okay? And again, you see more of this earlier in the early 60s. Once the war 
gets on full swing, it's real hard. I mean, things get worse as the war goes on. Wars tend to bring out the worst in people, and it becomes worse. Contrary to what uh, we heard a lot in the media during the war, it almost sounds like it could be compared in many ways to a, a genuine partisan resistance movement. Yeah, that, I, can I, we say that? Or? I mean, I, I think early on, I mean, they don't say ZMUS for nothing. Yeah. They see them as the same. And they see Z, they don't believe ZM is Vietnamese. I mean, he has kind of lost his Vietnamese credibility. He is a Yankee. You know, he's an, a, a Yankee aggressor. So as far as they're concerned, the people of, of Vietnam are fine. There's no problem there. It's just this small group of, and ZM is essentially a foreigner now. He's no different than the, than the Americans or the French were. So, yeah, I mean, in a sense, they would see it as a partisan war. A, they call it the struggle for national or the revolution. They never call it a civil war or anything like that. They often refer to it as either national liberation or revolution. That's the way they see it, yeah. So, um, but anyway, yeah, it's a good question. So we've kind of done, done the shtick on the South now, all right? You kind of see where, where that's headed. Now we get to the time when the U.S. really gets more deeply involved. Uh, I didn't say really anything about the U.S. role in Vietnam after 54 because you can take care of it fairly. It's, it's sending money and advisors to the ZM regime. The U.S. sends uh, billions of dollars there. And as I said, 78% of American money sent to ZM is used for the military in the South. The Southern Army is called the ARVN, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. Okay. And now the U.S. sees the ARVN, or the U.S. sends trainers to Vietnam to try to develop an ARVN capable of fighting against the North if it invades. The North is called, as I just said, the PAVN, the People's Army of Vietnam. Americans will refer to it as the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army. Actually, that was Maxwell Taylor's idea. He said, by calling it the PAVN, you give them credibility. You call them the People's Army. We're going to just call them the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army, because we don't want them people to think that they're on their side. Um, the U.S. wants this, these trainers and this money to be spent on developing an ARVN, which can fight, if it has to, against the North. Right? ZM takes the money and basically uses it to create an army that's going to protect the family and the family's uh, interests. So most of the money goes to uh, the military. And it's funny because the idea there is to reform. They keep talking about ZM. We need to reform. We need ZM to reform. Every memo the U.S. sends to ZM says, we're still waiting for you to reform. It's like Chiang Kai-shek or somebody like that. You know, We want you to reform. We need you to clean up your act. This is constant, but it's nothing more than lip service. And ZM knows they're not going to pull the rug out from it. It doesn't really take it seriously. So, uh, and in fact, the fact that the U.S. sends 78% of the money the U.S. sends is used for the military indicates the U.S. isn't terribly serious about this idea of reform. So basically, that's the late 50s. The trainers are there trying to build up an army that can fight this war against the North if it has to, and the, um, the, uh, and the U.S. is sending money to ZM. So then by 1960, things don't look so bad. I mean, ZM has stabilized the South. Uh, the insurgents are wiped out. They seem to be under control. The establishment of the NLF clearly is something to concern yourselves with, but no one really sees that yet as, as any kind of major crisis. Um, many Americans are aware that, you know, for example, a lot of the southern Vietnamese map has villages which are under VC control, NLF control, but they think this is temporary, and they believe that, you know, kind of more stuff, more guns, more weapons, more troops, more advisors will do the trick. And no one believes that more than John Fitzgerald Kennedy, senator from Massachusetts, and his team. This is Kennedy, Robert Strange McNamara, and the Secretary of State Dean Rusk, along with the uh, National Security Advisors, first Meg George Bundy, and then Walt Rostow. I say this is the major team for Vietnam, of course, LBJ, uh, Kennedy's successor. This is the major team which will make U.S. policy. Um, John Kennedy uh, is, you know, clearly one of the incredible figures in U.S. history. People feel very passionately about the Kennedys and the family. And Kennedy's role in Vietnam is the subject of really heated historical debate, which we're going to get at. I mean, especially 1991, when Oliver Stone's movie about JFK comes out, creates this idea that Kennedy really was a dove and that he was going to get out of Vietnam, but he couldn't because all these other forces in the military-industrial complex were forcing him to go to war there. And 
this was nothing new. Arthur Schlesinger, who's a court historian for the Kennedys, had been writing this for some time. And there, Ted Sorensen, who was one of Kennedy's closest advisors and friends, who actually wrote Profiles and Courage for Kennedy, for which Kennedy won the Pulitzer Prize, had been arguing this for some time. So this was kind of, even though this was pop culture, it really did reflect a serious academic argument that Kennedy, you know, really was the victim of forces and he would have done things differently and you would have never had the kind of Vietnam War you did if Kennedy had not been assassinated, okay? Um, you're going to get a different view, at least from me, on that, okay? And this is, the, this is never going to be settled. There are still a lot of people who want to hear that. So Kennedy takes over January 96. But it's interesting because... Uh, one doesn't really think of Dwight Eisenhower as a liberal, but Eisenhower, when I say Ike's advice, Eisenhower does two things before he leaves office, which I think are remarkable. Well, one's remarkable, one is important. One, which I'll talk about again later, is he tells Kennedy that, that uh, the, the advice he gives him with regard to Southeast Asia is that the important country there is Laos. He doesn't even mention Vietnam. He just says, be careful what happens at Laos because there's a revolution going on there too. But even more remarkable, which I think is one of the more important documents that I've ever seen, and I, you know, more people ought to be familiar with it, is three days before he leaves office, Eisenhower gives his farewell address, and you're, you're probably familiar with that. But in it, Eisenhower warns against two things. One, which people are familiar with, the other one less so. One is the military-industrial complex. Eisenhower says that uh, uh, these major corporations, especially those that have government defense contracts, simply have too much power and they're anti-democratic. And he has this wonderful uh, statement, I don't know if it's in this speech or not, uh, to the effect that um, every bomb that is made, every tank that is made, every airplane that flies, uh, represents in the end a theft from those who are hungry and are not fed, from those who are uh, uh, homeless and are not housed and so forth. It's really quite moving, quite powerful. It, it sounds like something that, you know, uh, some you know, peacenik would be saying rather than General of the Army Dwight Eisenhower. So Ike is basically saying, you know, let's step back. This Cold War thing maybe is getting out of hand. Let's step back and reevaluate it and maybe try to create a more just and democratic society. Now, of course, the cynic might say you had eight years. <laughs> but in fact, he is, you know, maybe it's the old age looking at, looking at his career or whatever and his own experience with war. But he says, let's step back. Let's take a look at this. The other thing, which is quite remarkable in this speech, which is less known, is he also attacks the universities. So the universities become little more than, you know, people who cash checks and do government research and pr promote this kind of bellicose war making machinery. I mean, Ike sounds like a hippie, right? He sounds like the new left would five, six years later. Everyone knows about the military, but he also goes after the universities, too, which I think is quite, quite striking. He says, you know, basically a, a government defense contract serves as a substitute now for free inquiry, and our universities have forgotten what their mission is, which is to teach people how to think critically. It's really quite remarkable. All right, so Kennedy gets this advice from Eisenhower. One, be careful about Laos. Two, step back. This, this military-industrial thing has gotten out of control. So what's Kennedy do three days later? Well, if you're familiar with the, his... Uh, um, inaugural address, then you know that he doesn't sound like ICAT on the 17th. Whereas Eisenhower says, let's be careful, this military industrial complex is anti-democratic. Kennedy says, we will pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. This we will do and more. How can you do more than that? How can you do more than bearing any burden, paying any price, meeting any hardship, supporting any friend, or opposing any foe? So basically, you know, Kennedy basically dismisses what Eisenhower said in his inaugural address. All right? Whereas Ike said, let's be a little reflective on this. Kennedy is gung-ho. This is kind of a, a young Viga, is the term they often used in his Boston accent. I had, they had Viga, a vigorous, young, testosterone-laden president, right, who, whose own uh, approach to life, the joie de vivre, is going to carry over this martial spirit. This energy is going to carry over. Uh, he's going to create a Peace Corps. He's going to revitalize America at home. He's going to have racial unity. People are going to be holding hands and singing, we are the world by the time he's done. And, you know, uh, not to be cynical, I mean, if, if you're looking at Kennedy in 1961, I mean, young people are energized. I mean, the country seems kind of on, the, on, on a flat line after World War II, after all the energy and patriotism of that. You have Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower, not exactly charismatic individuals. There seems to be this sense of stasis in 1960. I mean, Kennedy defeats Nixon in large measure because people want to change. It was a very close election, and Kennedy promises that. He's young, he's enthusiastic, he's energetic. People see this, and they run out in large numbers. Young people join the Peace Corps in large numbers. 
uh, there's a significant uh, involvement in charity work and volunteer work, uh, physical fitness programs because Kennedy, you know, he and the family go out and they play touch football and he had well, a 50 mile hike, uh, which he forced a lot of his aides to take. Pierre Salinger almost died, you know, uh, as a result of that. You know, Kennedy basically says, go and buy some hiking shoes. You're walking 50 miles this weekend, which Kennedy, I don't think, did that one. I, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think he went on that. I think he made his brother and some of his aides do it. But he's vigorous, he's young, and people, you know, after Ike, you know, this is just what the country needed. So there's this legitimate sense of, of, of uh, a renewal. He reaches out to Martin Luther King uh, during the campaign. So there's this sense that uh, you can have racial harmony and reconciliation. So um, uh, Kennedy really does represent a new way of doing things. And so when he says we're going to pay any price and bear any price, and during his address he also says the torch has been passed to a new generation. Okay? We're going to do things differently. He is a cold warrior. I mean, I think it's one of the great ironies is for anybody to see him as a dove. This is one of the premier, maybe the premier cold warrior of the post-war era. He had made a name for himself by opposing communists abroad and at home. He had voted for every single defense authorization bill ever thrown before. He had helped Joe McCarthy. His brother was one of McCarthy's staff lawyers. He wanted to root out communists. This is a hard-line cold warrior. I mean, he and John Foster Dulles, I mean, really, I think are the paradigmatic cold warriors of that generation. It is not some peacenik, all right? This is not some dove by any means. So Kennedy, then, his speech reflects his true values. To think that this man will somehow conjure anything, you know, is, is really strikes me as, as being quite ahistorical. Something else that's interesting, which a friend of mine who's a poet turned me on to, was that uh, I think we all know Robert Frost uh, read a poem at Kennedy's inaugural. Well, there's a little more to it than that, which I actually, to, to my great chagrin, didn't know, to my great embarrassment, didn't know until uh, about a year ago. I knew that Frost had written, read a poem, but what had happened was he had, he had written a poem specifically for Kennedy that day. Frost at the time was quite old. I don't know if he was in his 80s yet, but there was this incredibly brilliant son behind Frost. He couldn't read the poem that he had written for Kennedy, so he recited one from memory. And uh, my friend told me about this, and, and uh, it's really remarkable when you read it. It's called The Gift Outright. And I, I was going to read it. It's this Robert Frost poem that he read at Kennedy's inaugural. He didn't read. He, he recited from memory because he couldn't read the poem he had on him. Uh, but toward the end, it gets really interesting. Uh, and I think this is really a, a wonderful statement on what the Kennedy years are going to be like. The land was ours before we were the lands. She was our land more than 100 years before we were her people. She was ours in Massachusetts, in Virginia, but we were England's, still colonials, possessing what we still were unpossessed by, possessed by what we now no more possessed. Something we were withholding made us weak until we found it was ourselves. We were withholding from our land of living and forthwith found salvation in surrender. Such as we were, we gave ourselves outright. The deed of gift was many deeds of war to the land vaguely realizing westward, but still unstoried, artless, unenhanced, such as she was, such as she would become. I mean, you know, listen to the words in that. You know, this is our land, and the deed of gift was many deeds of war. This is a, a tribute, a, a, you know, a, 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 a hosanna to manifest destiny, to, to empire, right? This is a very subtle and beautiful way of saying the kind of stuff Rudyard Kipling was writing about earlier in the century. It's, you know, when, when my friend told me about this, I was just like, whoa, I was blown away. I couldn't, you know, this is just such a beautiful, perfect statement on what Kennedy was about. The deed of gift was many deeds of war, okay? So um, that's interesting. I think it's really fascinating and, and uh, uh, quite remarkable and quite prophetic in many ways. Uh, and in fact, the deed of gift would be, in fact, many deeds of war, okay? Uh, well, the, the, the last line, oh, go ahead. Did you attach that to the No, discussion? but I will. I'll, I'll, just, I'll attach it to one of, to one of my links. Actually, let me, let me go back just a moment. Uh, the last thing I have here is the Kennedy burden. And basically, you can see from where I'm headed. What I'm going to argue, in fact, is that Kennedy was deeply responsible for Vietnam. Um, whereas when Kennedy came to office, there were about 1,000, 800, actually, military advisors in Vietnam. By the time he leaves 1,000 days later, there are 16,000. So from 800 to 16,000, this huge increase, all right? Whereas Eisenhower had given Americans in Vietnam a, a mission to train the Arvin, uh, Kennedy begins a war of aggression with air power, with helicopters, with napalm, with crop destruction, with defoliation. 
whereas Indochina was simply a peripheral interest in the 1950s, Kennedy turns it into the centerpiece of the Cold War and ultimately a hot war, right? Kennedy then, in a fairly short period of time, I think more than anybody really bears responsibility for Vietnam. I don't know if there was ever a point at which the U.S. could have drawn back and said, we're not going to go through with this. But Kennedy clearly uh, makes matters much worse. And I would argue, in fact, as much as you know, there, there are legitimate reasons to criticize LBJ, LBJ inherits Kennedy's situation and really doesn't have anywhere near the options JFK did. I would argue JFK is the one person, may have been too late by then, but he had options that, that others did not have, and he chose not to pursue them. And I would argue that he did this not because, of, because that was the way he was. He sincerely chose to follow this policy because that's what he believed in, not because he was under pressure from the right wing, from the Republicans, because of fear of McCarthy's. I think it was legit. I think it was sincere. This is what Kennedy was. He was a cold warrior. He believed that Ho Chi Minh had to be stopped. All right. So I would argue that this, in fact, v Kennedy's Vietnam policy, in fact, is an accurate reflection of his true beliefs of his political ideology. It is not some kind of aberration. It is not something he was forced into. He was not a victim of circumstances. This is something he chose to do on his own. And it reflects quite accurately what he and his advisors believed in. Yeah. I have forgotten what the position of the Republican Party was at that time. I think Everett Dirksen became the majority leader after Johnson left. But was the Republican Party in the um, in Congress, uh, did they object in, say, the first two years of the Kennedy administration to the, uh, to the increased uh, involvement? No, nobody did. I mean, it would have, I mean, the question would have been why somebody would have, actually. Uh, it was just considered par for the course. Um, ironically, uh, there were two major critics of Vietnam from the 50s on. And if you know anything about politics in the 1960s, it's quite surprising on who they were. You can say George McGovern or Gaylord Nelson. Huh? Wayne Moore is actually later. Actually, the two earliest critics from the Senate are Richard Russell and John Stennis. If you know anything about politics in the 1960s, I defy you to find two more conservative pro-military senators than John Stennis and Richard Russell. Russell from Georgia, who was the head of the Armed Services, Senate, uh, Armed Services Committee, uh, Sam Nunn's um, uh, uncle, in fact, I believe, and John Stennis from Mississippi, who was an old Southern segregationist. These are two hardline pro-military people, both of whom from early 1950s on, from Dien Bien Phu on, are constantly and consistently critical of Vietnam. The U.S. has no reason to be there. It is not part of our interest. We don't belong. There's nothing we can do there. It's only going to be a mess. So, I mean, it's ironic that you actually, there is some diversity. For the most part, it's just not a major issue. Kennedy does come under attack. The Democratic Party's been under attack since 1949. Who lost China? Who's soft on communism? So they've always gone to great lengths to be seen as being a kind of a, a bellicose party. I mean, I think that goes on through the day. I mean, Clinton, I think, is still, you know, dealing with that. But again, I would argue, like Kennedy, this is what Clinton believes in, but that's another issue. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, you know, uh, the Democrats are under attack politically. And so there aren't a whole lot of Democrats who um, would oppose this. And in fact, if you, you know, if you study the election of 1960, Kennedy basically red baited Nixon. Nixon was soft on Cuba. Eisenhower and Nixon have let Fidel Castro set up a beachhead, a communist beachhead, just 90 miles from our border. I'll tell you what, if it were me, that Castro would be kicked out, right? I'd get rid of that guy. I mean, during the debates, Kennedy rips and rants and raves at Nixon for Castro. You know, you have let him go. And in fact, Kennedy knows at the time, because he has contacts within the CIA, that they're planning an invasion of Cuba. But what can Nixon do? Nixon can't say anything about it. He can't say, well, we're, we've got plans to get rid of Castro, right? Because it's debate. This is private information. This is confidential information. Kennedy outsleezes Nixon. And that's hard to do. It's the only time it ever happened. It took a Kennedy to do it. So Nixon, I mean, Nixon actually was treated unfairly during the debates. Kennedy manipulated him and Eisenhower. He claimed there was a missile gap. Eisenhower has let the country become dangerously weak, and the Soviet Union has power and control over us. They have so many more weapons and missiles. There was a missile gap, and it was dominantly in the U.S. favor, and Kennedy knew that. And again, he's using classified information to get at Eisenhower and Nixon. He trots out military people to campaign. The Democratic Party and the military had an alliance because Kennedy had promised them that he would increase defense budgets. If you know anything about the late 1950s, what happens? The military hates Eisenhower. Why? Because he cuts their budget. Ike believes in a balanced budget. He thinks the military has more money than it needs. So Eisenhower, and he starts giving money to the Air Force instead of the Army. 
because he wants, you know, nuclear deterrence from the air. So Kennedy basically goes to the military. He goes to people like Ridgeway and Gavin and um, Jay Lawton Collins and others, and he says, look, I, I need your help during the campaign. So retired military officers, Maxwell Taylor, are speaking out for Kennedy at every point because this country is dangerously weak. We're on the verge of falling behind the Soviet Union and falling under the Iron Curtain. And unless John Kennedy is elected and brings this vigorous Cold War approach, you know, we're in trouble because Eisenhower and Nixon are wimps. They're weak. Right? I mean, it's kind of what Nixon deserved after what he had done in, in the 40s and 50s. But the fact of the matter is Kennedy red-baited him. <laughs> Not quite red-baited, but, but you get the point. Yeah, right. So, um, you know, by the time Kennedy comes into office, uh, there aren't going to be a whole lot of people critical of what he does, and especially, as we'll see in a minute, uh, after um, uh, uh, the first series of problems he has. Kennedy, within uh, months, has two major crises uh, in Cuba and in Laos, and they both go bad. And basically, at that point, something which I wouldn't really consider anti-communism comes into play, and that's credibility. It's a term I brought up before. But Kennedy, in both Cuba and Laos, has fiascos. Things couldn't go worse. I mean, really, within three months, this hardline, cold warrior loses two big ones. In Cuba, he has the Bay of Pigs, which is just a disaster, and then in Laos, a neutral government, which essentially is very much influenced by the communists, comes into power. So in his first two major tests as president, Kennedy fails, right? And his credibility is on the line. He looks like this rookie. He looks like he's a novice. He, he, he doesn't have it, all right? And so um, next time, that's what we'll do. We'll start with deal by dealing with Cuba, with Laos, to show how Kennedy, in a, in a sense, is shaped by his own rhetoric. He's boxed in by his own background, by his own past. And he has no choice but to make a stand somewhere. And Vietnam has the bad fortune of being that place where the stand was made. In some ways, the Vietnam War was bad luck for the Vietnamese. It could have been elsewhere. It could have been somewhere else. All right. We will catch you next week.